Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good, so that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The psalm of the day is Psalm 16. We will read that psalm responsibly. Guard me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good heart from you. The holy ones who are in the land are glorious. All my delight is in them. Those who chase after another God will increase their sorrows. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood. I will not take out their names on my lips. Lord, you are the cup that has been given to me. You have secured a lot for me. The property lines chosen for me fall in pleasant places. Yes, the delightful inheritance is mine. I will bless the Lord who guides me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. Even my flesh will bless you. Because you will not abandon my life to the grave. You will not let your favor once see the day. You have made known to me the path of life, fullness of joy in your presence. first lesson from God's Word is found in the Apostle Peter's first letter, chapter 3. He reminds us that as we live for Christ during the world, we will suffer in one way or another, but we always find strength in our Lord Jesus and in, in his many blessings to us through baptism. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should happen to suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of what they fear and do not be troubled. But regard the Lord, the Christ, as holy in your hearts. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for hope that is in you. But speak with gentleness and respect while maintaining a clear conscience, so that those who attack your good way of life in Christ may be put to shame because they slander you as evildoers. Indeed, it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but was made alive in spirit, in which he also went and made announcement to the spirits in prison. Those spirits disobeyed long ago, when God's patience was waiting in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In this ark a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. 
And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He went to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. We sing the verse of the day. speaking to his disciples the night before he died, giving them comfort and assuring them of his peace. His words are for us and for Christians of every age as we live in this evil world. If you love me, hold on to my commands. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he stays with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The one who has my commands and holds on to them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and show myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. everybody here. That's Linnea. But I had to look it up. But did she paint this picture? No. Because she's a dead doll too. So do you know do you know who painted this picture? It wasn't me. But do you know who painted it? No. Well, what you don't know, the one you don't know, I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to tell you who painted this picture so that you know. The person that painted this picture was my father. And he painted it for me when I was four years old. So I've had this for some years at home. But he painted that picture of the, of the three little pigs. Now, how do you know now that my father painted this picture? I just... I just told you, didn't you? So I revealed to you who painted this picture. But also, he put his initials at the bottom, like artists often do, CLF, Clifford Leroy Furch, 52. That's 1952 that he painted that picture. 
So you know who made this picture because I told you that it wasn't these lifeless dolls, but it was my father who painted this picture. And we know that he painted the picture because he put his initials on it to reveal it. And that's what we're going to talk about today in the sermon. That people don't know who the real God is. But sometimes they think that lifeless, false gods created the world and saved us from our sins. But the Apostle Paul reveals who did do it, those things. And of course that's who, who created the world and who made us and forgave our sins. God, right. And God reveals himself in creation and in our consciences. And then he tells us that he did those things as he reveals his name in the Bible, the true God and Jesus. So we'll see how Paul made known the unknown God by revealing his works and also the name of the Savior. Okay? We'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us all things that you have created and especially for sending Jesus to be our Savior. We would not know those things without those works or without the revelation of your name in Jesus in the Bible. And we thank you for that revelation and may we be always willing and able to tell others and reveal you to others so that they may know that it is you who did those things for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming out. We'll continue with our next hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The text of our sermon this morning is our lesson from Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 22. Then Paul stood up in front of the council of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking around and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which had been inscribed to an unknown God. Now what you worship as unknown, this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, since he himself gives all people life and breath and everything they have. From one man he made every nation of mankind to live over the entire face of the earth. He determined the appointed times and the boundaries where they would live. <clears throat> he did this so they would seek God and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, indeed, we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and planning. Although God overlooked the times of ignorance, he is now commanding all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he appointed. He provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of our Lord and Savior, living and reigning, your fellow redeemed. The good citizens of ancient Athens, Greece, had an, an attitude and application of inclusion when they built temples to their gods. In his People's Bible on Acts, seminary, former seminary professor Richard Balgi wrote, it is said that there were more gods than men in Athens. And why was that? Because the Athenians didn't want to inadvertently miss one. They had temples to all these gods, but they wondered, well, maybe we've missed somebody and we don't want to offend them, we don't want to anger them, so we'll build a temple and they engraved on that temple to an unknown God. And Paul had seen that as he had wandered around the city and he used that as a starting point to reveal to them who the true God is. And he said, now what you worship as unknown, this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Let's take a few minutes this morning and look at the Apostle Paul's words in his purpose. God's works made known the unknown. And we'll see, first of all, that God's works have visible proof. And secondly, that through the revelation of those works, God makes himself known. Paul had been asked to appear before the highest court in ancient Greece. They were men who would judge new laws, new religions. They would evaluate the, the preaching of, of new gods. And they met on top of Mars Hill in Athens, 
and the Greek word for Mars Hill is Areopagus. And so the council took the name of the place where they met. Paul did not begin his apologetic by trying to explain the personal nature of God. He didn't try to explain to them the Trinity. Interestingly, he didn't even begin with Jesus' cross quite yet. To make, the, to make known the unknown, Paul began with the creation of the universe and all mankind from one man, that special creation, Adam. We notice that the apostle did not attack the false gods of the Greeks. He didn't, he didn't criticize them. He took quite a different approach, didn't he, than say, Elisha, or Elijah, rather, who challenged directly the Baal God and challenged him to match the works of his God. But Paul, understanding the way these philosophers and thinkers approach things, with not quite a compliment, but meeting them where they were, Paul said to them, I see that you are very religious in every way. And we can almost picture them going, yeah, we are. You're, you're right. We're, we're glad you understand us. Paul gives us a good approach, doesn't he, for our own evangelism. That we don't just suddenly attack the religion of others, but grant that they, they understand and know that there's a God and some things about that God, and what they don't know, well, we're going to tell them. And so from that starting point of creation, Paul made known the unknown. None of their false gods created the universe. They even understood that none of their false gods actually were the ones from whom they were offspring. And so Paul said, the unknown I'm going to make known. You don't know that God? Now you know. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made with hands. That's significant. He's neither served by human hands as if he needed anything. That's the essence of idolatry, isn't it? A God made by human hands. A God that is served by human hands of silver or gold or stone. As if someone would go to that, that monument company just south of town and would take a piece of that, that granite and would carve a God and then build a temple to that God, put it in there and bring it food and drink and serve it as if it needed something. Paul said, no, that unknown God that I'm telling you about isn't like that. And he doesn't need any of those things. In fact, he is the one who gives life and he gives breath and he's beyond the temple made with hands. And he is the one who doesn't need anything. In fact, he is the one who gives us everything. The Apostle Paul made known the true God by his works, the work of creating the universe and everything in it, of bringing mankind from one man. He made every nation of mankind to live over the entire face of the earth. He determined the appointed times and boundaries where they would live. You and I and all human beings are brothers and sisters under the skin. 
We are all descendants of the one man, Adam. There is no place for any kind of, of racial or social or cultural prejudice or discrimination among Christians because we are not different from any other human being other than our languages, other than our nationalities, and those things also are from God, aren't they? God determined races. Think of all races coming from the three sons of Noah. God determined where man lived after the Tower of Babel, and he confused their languages, and in a miracle, he scattered them across the face of the earth. Nations and their boundaries rise and fall, and peoples migrate from one place to another, even where we decide to live and move and have our being. God watches over that and determines that and sees that we are blessed in those decisions. The Greeks believed in a higher being. They didn't know who he was. And in their natural knowledge of God, in that sense of God, they, they created these deities. But they knew that there was something higher than they, higher than them, who were, was in control of their life. They were very much pantheistic. Pantheistic means that, that the divine nature is a part of nature. It's, it's in nature. We think of the, the, the religions that believe the astrology and Mother Earth watches over us. They, the Greeks named the planets, Mars, Venus, Mercury, the god of war, the goddess of love, the god of the messenger god. The Greeks did not believe the big lies of evolution, that we are somehow formed from lower forms of life over millions and millions of years. The Greeks did not accept the lie of the Big Bang, that material is eternal, and that suddenly it just formed into the beautiful and orderly universe in which we now live. The Greeks weren't so arrogant like the fools today who say, there is no God, even though creation and their conscience tells them otherwise. We really can't underestimate the danger that the big lie of evolution has in its attacks against our faith. And we're surrounded by it, we're flooded by it every day of our lives, especially our children. It's especially dangerous to our children in secular education and social media. What a wonderful opportunity our 7th and 8th graders have as they leave today to visit the Creation Museum and the Ark Experience. It will be a wonderful reinforcement for their faith and their trust that God, the living God, made all things. And he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Remember we learned in Catechism that God makes himself known in creation and in our conscience. And Paul says, God wants man, maybe through those things, to seek him, to look for him. To seek him with questions like, I know in my heart that God exists from those things, 
but I don't know who he is. Maybe I should try to find out. Or, boy, I'm, I, I'm just so guilt. I feel so guilty and burdened because of my sins. I wonder if, if there's a God who's done something about that. And what did he do about it? And so now, Paul turns from creation to Christ. Now he turns from the works of nature to judgment and repentance and resurrection. Paul told the Greeks that the true God that they were coming to know is quite different and unique from their false god, false gods who inhabited the temples around the city. He is not far away. He is not in creation. He overlooks sin for a while, but he has set a day of judgment, and he wants all people to repent, and he has raised his son Jesus from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. We heard all about that, didn't we, in our first lesson. Think of the time of grace that God gave the people in Noah's day before the flood came. But then judgment came. And then in a type of baptism, God spared Noah and his family with the waters of the flood, just as the word connected to the water saves us in holy baptism. The true God commands all to repent. Paul is acknowledging that natural knowledge of sin and the true God in their heart. And he was now revealing to them the one to whom they could confess those sins and to whom they could look in faith for forgiveness of those sins. Pantheism aside, there was a real disconnect between the Greeks and their gods. They, you know, the people visited their temples, they took them food and drink, they even provided them prostitutes, but there was no real interpersonal relationship between these gods and the people. And the people just hoped to have peace and and something beyond life by bringing these sacrifices and by doing good works. They believed that the gods were active in their lives, but they believed that those actions were often capricious and cruel, and that their gods could not be depended on for anything merciful. And so Paul said, the one you don't know, now you know. He's coming in judgment. He calls you to repentance. And he has raised his son Jesus from the dead, declaring the forgiveness of all your sins. You and I know that every word of every encounter is not recorded in the Bible. We're safe to say that somewhere along the line, Paul mentioned Jesus' name. When he was talking about the man who would judge and, and the man who was raised from the dead, he would have revealed that name of Jesus Christ. In fact, the reason he was there is that he was preaching Jesus around the city of Athens. And speaking their language, he said to them that judgment and that resurrection it's not going to come by one of your idols of silver or gold, an image formed by human skill and planning. In fact, even your poets know that we are under the rule of a god. Since about 600 BC, the Greek poets had been writing, we are his offspring. And again, like people today who don't believe there's a God or believe that God has nothing to do 
with our lives or that God did not form us and begin our lives in the wombs of our mothers whom we honor today, the Greeks knew in their hearts that they were God's offspring. And Paul said in him that God that I'm telling you about, the living God, it is in him that we live and we move and we have our being and we have the forgiveness of sins by the resurrection of his son. In the verses just after our text, we read that things were going well till Paul got to the part about the resurrection. And then some of those thinkers and philosophers began to have a little bit of a problem with that. And they began to, to scoff at what Paul was preaching and this new religion. But we also read but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And some men became followers of Paul and believed. Many people today are very religious in every way. What does ancient Greece have to do with Watertown, Wisconsin in 2023? We're living among the same people. We're living in the same attitudes. People worship all kinds of idols today. Others call themselves agnostic. God probably exists, but there's really no way that we can know who he is. They're still building temples to false gods around the world and in our country, and next to the freeway, south of Milwaukee. God has given us many opportunities to speak up, to stand up like Paul did, and say to people, the God you don't know, the God that you now worship as unknown, that is what I am going to proclaim to you. And again, to go back, Paul didn't even say to them who you don't know, but rather what you don't know. And then he began with God's works. People are known through their works. God is known through his works of creation and through the work of sending his son Jesus to be our Savior. Now as we speak up, when we get to the part about the resurrection, some will scoff, but some will want us to hear again, and some will begin to follow Jesus and be saved through faith in him. Amen. And now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now in confessing our saving Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we'll gather our offerings.
We stand to pray. Lord of all good, our gifts we bring you now. Use them, your holy purpose to fulfill. Tokens of love and pledges they shall be that our whole life is offered to your will. Father, whose bounty all creation shows, Christ, by whose willing sacrifice we live, Spirit, from whom all life and fullness flows, to you with grateful hearts, ourselves we give. Amen. Let's turn to the responsive prayer for the season of Easter. You'll find it in the service folder on page 6. We include a prayer for Christian mothers on Mother's Day and really every day. We also thank the Lord for supplying our teacher need at TSL with the assignment of a candidate at MLC yesterday. His name is Joseph Haraway. He is being called to serve as grade 7 teacher and athletic director at TSL. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who, makes, who lives to make intercession for the saints and grant us confidence in the greatness of his power. Keep before us the vision of your redeemed people standing before your throne and singing the song of victory. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and new life to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. Loving Savior, we thank you for your gift of Christian mothers. We praise you for the care, love, guidance, and Christian instruction you have given us through them. Bless them always in their role. Give them patience, understanding, and deep love for their families. Help bless their sons and daughters to always honor them according to your commandment. Holy Spirit, through the church, you have called many men and women to full-time gospel service. We are thankful for answering our prayers by providing a teacher for our school, Trinity St. Luke's. We ask you to equip Joseph Herowig for service to the children and families of our two congregations. Bless him and all who serve in our school as they teach and train Christ's lambs and sheep. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts, we come before you and say, Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Amen. We pray together our Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We welcome guests to worship. We pray for Christ's many blessings to you. Please come again. This Thursday is an important Christian festival, the festival of the ascension of our Lord. Forty days after rising from the dead, Jesus left his disciples with his visible presence. When he went up into the sky, he ascended into heaven. We gather to worship Christ at the festival of his ascension this Thursday, one service at 6.30. A reminder that next Sunday, on the 21st, we have a voters meeting after the second service. At that voters meeting, we will discuss and pass our ministry plan or budget for the next fiscal year. And then in two weeks, Memorial Day weekend, we switch to our summer schedule. That will not concern most of you because most of you are regular 8 o'clock worshipers. 
The second service on Sunday is will shift from 10.30 to 9.30 for the summer through Labor Day weekend. 8 o'clock stays the same. Wednesday at 6.30 also stays the same. So in two weeks, 8 o'clock, 9.30 on Sundays for the summer months. Stick around for snacks and some time together in the fire sick room. Then Bible study will get started at 9.20, 9.25 downstairs. Philippians chapter 3 is our Bible study topic for today. Also, we have Sunday school for the children. May the Lord Jesus bless your day and your week ahead.